Okay, so we're looking at the last week of Jesus' life. He's going to be crucified in a few days' time, and he's teaching in the temple, and people are coming to him and asking questions. But they're not asking questions to learn. They're asking questions to set him up. Basically, they're Jesus' enemies, and they're gathering together against Jesus. And as we read this, we see certain characteristics of Jesus' enemies, and it's worth us looking at ourselves and seeing do we display these same characteristics that Jesus' enemies did. So let's read Matthew 22, starting at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. The same day, Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us, the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, Who do you, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Let's pray. Lord God, don't let us be enemies to you today. Please reveal to us where we are acting like enemies to you. Please change our hearts today. Save people today so that we are not your enemies, but that we are your sons. Amen. 
So let's go through this. Verse 15, it starts off saying, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Notice there's two groups coming together here. You've got the Pharisees and you've got Herodians. So you've got two groups and these two groups had differing opinions. It would be like the Pharisees are pro-Jewish and they don't like the Romans being in the land and they want the Romans to go out of the land and they're certainly not keen on paying taxes to Caesar because by paying taxes to the Romans it's like being like a slave and saying we're slaves to Caesar. Now on the other hand you've got the Herodians who would follow the monarchy there of King Herod and they would quite like Rome because Rome is giving them all their benefits allowing Herod and his family to be the royalty in, in Judea. So those guys would probably like the idea of paying taxes to Caesar. And these two groups come to Jesus to put him in between a rock and a hard place, as we say. Now, interesting that these opposing groups come together. Why do they both come together? You know, they shouldn't really like one another too much. But the reason why they come together is because all human beings, deep down, are God-haters and are hostile to God. And that's why you get people with totally different opinions, and you see it today in the world, and they will come together against Christ because they don't like Christ. And so they ask him this question, not to find out an answer, but it says to entangle him in his words. So they're hoping to entangle Jesus with his response because many Jews would think we're God's chosen people. We deserve to be in the land. These Romans don't deserve to be here. The Romans don't deserve to charge us a tax. Now, if Jesus then says pay taxes to Caesar, it alienates him from most of the Jews and it makes him seem like he's not a real prophet. And they would think, aren't you pro-Israel? Don't you support us being in the land? You can see it's very similar to today. People will ask you questions about this. And they will make him look like he's not really on God's side, he's not really on Israel's side. But on the other hand, if Jesus says, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then the Herodians will be like, what? Don't you know that Caesar is running things here? And then they can get him arrested by the Romans for insurrection for preaching against the state, preaching against Caesar. And they've given him an either or question. Is it pay taxes to Caesar or don't pay taxes to Caesar? And look how Jesus responds. Verse 18. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? So Jesus recognizes what they're trying to do. And he lets them know that he is aware of this. And the application here is that Jesus knows your heart today. You can't trick him. He knows where you're at. So as we look at the scripture today, don't deceive yourself. Don't try and make yourself to be better than you really are. You can trick yourself and you can trick other people, but you can't trick Jesus. Verse 19, Jesus says, Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. So notice they gave him an either or question. And Jesus doesn't fall into their trap. He doesn't give an either or answer. He gives a both answer. He says, yeah, you give to Caesar what Caesar's and you give to God what is God's. And I think there's, there's wisdom here for us when people ask us controversial questions. 
You know, people are always trying to trip Christians up saying, what do you think about Israel? The Israelis and the Arabs, what are your thoughts on this? They're trying to get you to do an either or answer rather than a biblical answer. People say, what do you think about homosexuality? They're trying to get you to either, they want you to either say, I condone a homosexual lifestyle, or they want you to say, I hate homosexuals. And either way, they get you. And it's the same with Arabs and Jews. They want you to say that you hate one and love the other. And Jesus gives a biblical answer instead. But that's not the main point of today's sermon. Look at what Jesus' reason is for giving money to Caesar. He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Well, why does the money belong to Caesar? Because it's got his likeness and inscription. He says, whose likeness and inscription is this? In verse 20. So the money had a picture of Caesar's head on it, had the likeness of Caesar on it, and it had an inscription with his name on it. So you knew it was Caesar's money, so it belonged to him really. So give to him what is due to him. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. He then says, he adds to it, give to God what is God's. So think about it. If the things that had Caesar's likeness on them belong to Caesar, then what are the things that belong to God going to have on them? Going to have God's likeness, right? And we see that here, this word he uses for likeness, where he says, whose likeness is it? This is the Greek word, a cone. And if we do a search for this in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Genesis, we see this used in Genesis in a number of places, and every time it's used in a very similar way to this. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And you see it in the other verses in Genesis, talking about being born in someone's likeness. It's the same word, acon. So when Jesus talks about the money having the likeness of Caesar and therefore belonging to Caesar, and then says, give to God what is God's, I think by implication there is the fact that you human beings have God's likeness on you because you're made in his image. Therefore, you should give your lives to God. Interesting, because the Pharisees are asking these small-minded questions about taxes. Should we really give our taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus comes to the heart of the issue and shows that these Pharisees aren't really giving their whole lives to God. They've got these little rules they go by, but they're not giving their whole lives to God. And so the point here is, give your life to God. Give your life to God. The characteristic of an enemy of Jesus is someone who likes little rules to follow but doesn't give their whole life to God. They don't recognize that God has put his stamp on them. They're made in God's image and they belong to God and they were made to glorify God. And often we don't live our lives to glorify God. We live our lives to glorify ourselves. Every human being is a worshiper. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. We naturally worship. That's the way we were created. And we either worship God or ourself or some other thing. And when we don't worship God, then what's happening is that we are... Sorry, I lost my train of thought there with the distraction. What was I saying? When we... There you go. We either worship, thank you, we either worship God or we worship ourselves or something else. And a sad fact for the matter is most of the time we don't worship God. We don't make him the most important focus of our life. And we don't live our life to glorify God. I mean, how often do we go through the Bible thinking, I've got a problem with such and such an area. Let me see what the Bible says on that area. Oh, I found one verse on that. That's good. That's not how we're supposed to read the Bible. There's nothing necessarily wrong with doing that. But we're supposed to read the Bible understanding that God made us to glorify him and we need to glorify him. And the whole Bible story is about God saving us so that we can glorify him. It's not a glorified self-help book. 
And the way we spend our time often doesn't glorify God. Like if you wrote a diary of how you spend all your free time, if someone else read that diary, would they be like, here is someone who glorifies God? Maybe. Maybe not. So if you're thinking, no, my diary wouldn't reflect that, then repent. Ask Jesus for forgiveness today and ask him to give you the strength to give your life to God. He will enable you to do that if you ask him. He's not like walking down the street today. I mean, first I had a firework thrown at me. Then I saw some mum shouting at her kid who was on the wrong side of the road. And she's shouting at him, cross safely, cross safely now. And I thought, thank God that he's not like that with us. He doesn't yell at us saying, give your life to me now. He says, give your life to me. But he will carry you across the road. He will enable you to do it. He's a loving father who saves us and he enables us to serve him. But sadly, these people, they didn't respond to Jesus in repentance when they heard what he said. And instead, they left. And then another group turns up, verse 23. The same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. So we see another group of people now, the Sadducees. So we've had the Pharisees and the Herodians, and they don't agree with one another. And now we've got the Sadducees, and the Sadducees don't agree with the Pharisees. They don't believe there's a resurrection. They also don't believe in all the books of the Old Testament that the Pharisees did. And they come to Jesus, and they think they've got a really good argument. You know, they think, yeah, with this argument, we can disprove the resurrection. And you may have experienced this yourself. People come to you and they're like, ah. And they come to you with your question and you're like, do people really think that over the last 2,000 years no one has ever thought of that before? There is an answer for it. And what Jesus does is he, he disproves the argument, but at the same time he reveals their problem. Just like he did with the Pharisees, he now shows the Sadducees, the enemies of Jesus, what their problem is. He answers in verse 29, you are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. That's their problem there. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So, you know, Jesus disproves their argument by saying that in heaven, you won't be married. You know, and we find later in scripture that everyone is married to Jesus. That's the way the relationship goes. You won't be married in heaven. And then he answers from, from a book in the Bible, from, from the, Septu uh, the uh, Pentateuch, he explains to them that God is not the God of dead people, but the God of living people. He calls himself the God of Abraham after Abraham has died. And it shows that Abraham is alive and not dead. Now, he could have gone to the book of Daniel to really easily prove the resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't believe in the book of Daniel. So he uses a book that they believe in. Easily destroys their argument, but the important thing is he reveals their sin at the same time, and he says, you are wrong because you neither you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he says later in verse 31, have you not read? So we see here a characteristic of Jesus' enemies is that they don't know the scriptures. And so the application here is know the scriptures. You must know the scriptures. And when you think you know the scriptures really well, 
It's a sign that you don't know them and you need to know them better. And even if you think you know them really well compared to other people around you, that's a sign that you move in circles of people that don't know the scripture very well. We need to know the scriptures. Not knowing the scriptures is a sign of Jesus' enemies. It's not right that our TV time or our computer game time or whatever time exceeds our Bible reading time. It's not meant to be that way. But the Sadducees didn't just know the scriptures, they also didn't know God's power. Because he says, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. They didn't believe that God could raise people from the dead. And today you'll find people that even read the Bible, but don't believe in the miracles that Jesus did. And they don't believe in Jesus' power. They're called liberals, liberal Christians, but really they should be called non-Christians. They're not Christians at all. So the point here is believe in God's power. Believe in the powerful God who split open the sea so that the Israelites could cross through, who opened the eyes of the blind, and who by doing these things demonstrated clearly that he can save you and he can open your eyes and he can change your life. Don't doubt God's ability to change your life. Don't for a second think God can't help you, but a local GP can by giving you antidepressants. Especially not if you've read the news lately. Where they're all like, oh, they don't work. By the way, I'm not discounting that there are sometimes medical conditions that you need help with, but I'm just saying, believe in God's power, first and foremost, to change you. Now let's look at the third assault that's launched against Jesus. Verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Notice, you've got the Pharisees now, they've flopped. And the Pharisees are like back on. This is like a ta tag team wrestling thing, you know. And it says, the Pharisees, they gathered together. They actually gather together to do a full onslaught on Jesus Christ. Now this phrase, they gathered together, the, the phrase in the Greek is word for word the same as the phrase in the Greek of the Septuagint of Psalm 2, verse 2. The NIV translates it as this. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And we see in Acts chapter 4 that the early church interpreted this verse as what is going on all the time when people come against Jesus and the work of his church. And we see, I think, that Matthew's alluding to this here, showing that when these Pharisees gather around Jesus, they are being an example of Psalm 2.2. 2. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against his anointed one. The anointed one is the Messiah, which is transliterated as the Christ. And this is what these people are doing, and, and this happens all the time. Jesus' enemies gather together against him. So don't be surprised when you see even different religions in the world today come together against Christianity where you see different political groups or different social groups or whoever come together and agree together that Christianity is the bad religion. Have you noticed how people are all saying like, let's tolerate everyone, everyone's got their own way, but let's not tolerate the Christians because the Christians say they have the only way. <laughs> so everyone's agreed to tolerate one another except for Christians. Let's all have freedom of speech. But let's not let the Christians have freedom of speech. Their views about certain things are too exclusive. And that is the people gathering together against Jesus. It also, an application here could be, if you find yourself grumbling against Christians and the church amongst non-Christians, be very careful. In light of this verse, if you find yourself chatting to a bunch of non-Christians and slagging off the church, then what is happening with you? You're gathering together against Christ. 
when Paul persecuted the church, Jesus said to him, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? When we have a go at the church, we have a go at Jesus. Let's make sure we don't link arms with non-Christians and start slating the church. So these enemies come together against Jesus and they ask him what the greatest commandment of the law is. This is something people were trying to work out themselves. They like their laws and they're like, well, what's the greatest one? And he answers them, but at the same time reveals their sin. Verse 37, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Now, I believe this phrase means love God wholeheartedly. You'll actually find this phrase dotted around the scriptures said in slightly different ways. Sometimes it doesn't say mind, it says strength instead. Sometimes it says mind and strength. I don't think we're necessarily supposed to categorize all these different categories and be like, now I'm doing soul love and now I'm doing mind. You know, I think it means love him wholeheartedly with your whole being. Everything about you loves God. Now, we can easily love God half-heartedly, can't we? I mean, that we're just prone to do that and not really be serious about God. And we need to safeguard against that. We need to be aware of that and ask Jesus to change us and repent and ask him to give us the ability to love God wholeheartedly. What we can also do is we can have strong opinions about things just like the Pharisees did. The Pharisees are there talking to Jesus and they got really strong opinions about stuff. And, but they're not loving God wholeheartedly. And we can do that. We can be interested in doctrine, just like the Pharisees were, but not love God wholeheartedly. So the application is, love God wholeheartedly. Don't have any other gods before him. Don't allow anything else in your life to take priority above God. Because this is what God's enemies do. They act like they're religious, but they don't have God as their first priority. And then Jesus gives the second commandment, verse 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God should be the first priority. But then the second priority should be loving our neighbor to the same degree that we love ourselves. Love others as much as you love yourself. Now that's pretty much impossible. <laughs> To love others as much as you love yourself. How much time do you spend in the day thinking about what you want? Thinking about yourself. You might not look at yourself in the mirror, but throughout the day you're thinking, what do I want? What side of the road do I want to walk on? What kind of lunch do I want to eat today? What do I want to drink? Do I need another drink now? Do I want to work a bit harder? Do I want to chill out a bit? Do I want to lie down now? What do I want to do? We spend a whole day loving ourselves. And we're told here that that devotion we give to ourselves, we should give to other people. Can you imagine that? Spending your whole day thinking, I wonder what the person next to me wants right now. I want, do they need a rest right now? That, you know, we, that is really what we're called to do. But that's so alien to us. So this is what we're called to do. Love others as much as we love ourselves. We can do this in how we serve people in being patient with people, in evangelism. You now, if we don't tell people the gospel, it's a sign that we don't really love them. We're happy that we've got the gospel, and we'd want someone to give us the gospel if we didn't have it, but we don't want to give the gospel to other people. Uh, if you're thinking, oh, I'm not loving other people as much as myself, which hopefully everyone's thinking that, otherwise you're a liar, then repent and ask Jesus for forgiveness and ask him to change your heart and renew your mind so that you do love people. And then Jesus says in verse 40, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So the Bible, when he says the law and the prophets, he's talking about the whole Old Testament. It contains many commandments in it. And Jesus is basically saying, if you were to view 
well, this is me saying kind of how, what I think Jesus is saying. If you were to view the Old Testament as a big door, got this big door, the Old Testament full of commandments, there would be two hinges on that door holding the door up. These two hinges on which the door turns would be hinge one, love God, hinge two, love your neighbor. So loving God and others are the hinges for all the commands. And this is important because sometimes people, like the Pharisees, will look for some specific commandments to follow so they feel good about themselves. But they forget that that specific commandment means nothing if it doesn't have the basis of loving God or loving your neighbor. Some people like to make up very precise rules. Some people have rules about how loud worship should be. Now, obviously, we need to be sensible about how loud worship should be. But some people will leave a church because the worship's too loud or too quiet. And they need to be aware that that rule they've made <laughs> needs to be based on loving God and loving your neighbor. Otherwise, it's just a petty opinion that we have. I wonder how many petty opinions we have that aren't based on loving God and loving our neighbor. So let us not be Christians that make rules that don't reflect love for God or love for neighbor. And let us not be Christians who study the Bible but don't love people. Now maybe you recognize that you can't live this life. <laughs> maybe you realize you can't love God with your whole being and maybe you realize you can't give the devotion to other people that you give to yourself. And if that's the case, then you're in a good place to be right now. Because this is the place where you realize, I need a savior. I can't do this. I need someone else who can do this. Who can save me. And that person is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what we look at now. Verse 41 now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, so Jesus' enemies are gathered together, and, you know, they think they're going to keep questioning Jesus, but now Jesus questions them. And that's the most important thing. <laughs> People have got all the things they launch at Jesus, but the big thing is, what does Jesus say to you? And he says, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he a son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So what Jesus does here is he now, he's talked to them about giving your life to God. He's talked to them about loving God and loving your neighbor. And now he doesn't leave it there. He asks them a question about the identity of the Messiah. And he does it by referring to Psalm 110. That's what this is here. It's a quotation from Psalm 110. Now the Jews in those days viewed Psalm 110 as a messianic psalm. And when I use the word Messiah, think of the same word as Christ. It's the same thing, Messiah and Christ, the anointed one. Now King David wrote the psalm in Psalm 110. And the Jews knew that the Messiah, the Christ, was going to be a descendant of David. Get that from 2 Samuel chapter 7. They knew he was going to be one of David's great-great-grandchildren. And the Pharisees showed that they believe that here, because Jesus says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they say, the son of David. So they know one of David's ancestors, uh, sorry, descendants, is going to be the Christ. But Jesus then points out that in Psalm 110, David says this phrase, the Lord said to my Lord. Sounds a bit funny, doesn't it? The Lord said to my Lord. So let's break that down. The first Lord is referring to God. So David's saying God, the Lord, 
And then he says, said to my Lord. We've got a, a second Lord here. Now the second Lord is referring to Christ, the Messiah. So he's saying, God said to the Messiah, or God said to the Christ. Okay. Now, and they would have got that. They would have been like, yeah. But notice that when David says the second Lord, he says, my Lord. So David says, you got David here, and he's kind of at this level. He says, the Lord God said to my Lord. So you've got another Lord who is above David because he's his Lord. And in Jewish culture, it would be really strange to refer to one of your descendants as superior to you. If anything, you would be superior to them. So you've got King David here talking about the Christ who's going to be one of his descendants, but calling him my Lord, elevating him above himself and elevating him to the divine status because he calls himself my Lord. So what we see is that David in this psalm actually acknowledges that his descendant, the Christ, is going to be Lord, is going to be God himself. So you've got God saying to God. <laughs> and the way it breaks down is you've got the Father says to the Son and then the rest of the, of the psalm. So Jesus is making the point here, you lot are expecting the descendant of David to be the Messiah. Well, do you get that that descendant is not just going to be human? He's going to be God as well. And they don't like that. They don't want to believe that Jesus is God. They like the idea of an earthly Messiah, a human one who's going to destroy the Romans. But they don't like the idea of Jesus who is God. In the same way, a lot of people today like the idea of Jesus who will help you with your problems, who has wise teachings, but they don't like the idea of Jesus as Lord. And that's how enemies of Jesus go on. So the application here is believe that Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus is God. Enemies of Christ do not believe this. You cannot say you honor Jesus and not believe that Jesus is God. It's very sad. Muslims will tell you they honor Jesus. They do not honor Jesus. If you do not believe he is God, you do not honor Jesus Christ. And what does this Christ do? It says in verse 44, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So it says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now this is a position that Jesus took after he died on the cross and he rose again and he ascended up to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus is on the throne. And one day God the Father is going to put all of Jesus' enemies under his feet. And in ancient times when a king conquered a people, his enemies he would put his foot on their head as a sign that they were now in subjection to him and he had conquered them. This means that one day everyone will be submitted to Jesus Christ. There will be people who have willingly said, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. And they will be married to him. And there will be others who never accepted Jesus' lordship and they will have Jesus' foot on their head, as it were, forced to submit and will spend a life in eternal hell. So therefore we should view Jesus as king and submit our life to him. Submit your life to Jesus' rule. Because the enemies of Jesus don't submit their life to Jesus' rule. And going up the front at church one day and responding to an altar call does not necessarily mean you're submitting your life to Jesus' rule. So let's make sure we do that. And if, if you don't live your life in submission to Jesus, Repent now. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. You are Lord God and I haven't submitted to you. Forgive me of my sin. I turn to you. Save me. So let's sum this up. 
Give your life to God, your whole life. You have the image of God on you. You belong to him. And if you're a Christian, you were bought with a price, Jesus' blood. So you are a, a servant of God now, under the new covenant. You're not your own to do your own thing. You were bought. You belong to God. You belong to Jesus. Give your whole life to him. And know the scriptures. Know the scriptures and get to know them more and more and more and more. When In the old days, when someone made a covenant with someone, when a king made a covenant with a people, part of the covenant Part of the covenant was a way by which the people could keep reading the covenant, covenant so that they knew how to live out the covenant correctly. And that's what's happening with the new covenant. We've been given the scriptures so that we read the scriptures daily and we know how to live our lives in a way that pleases God. Believe in God's power. Don't doubt God's power. Believe in God's power to change your life. Believe in God's power to see other people's lives change as people are brought into submission to Jesus Christ and in a relationship with God. And love God wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. And love others as much as you love yourself. And remember that loving God and others are the hinges on which all the other commandments hang. And believe that Jesus is the Christ and is God. And lastly, submit your life to Jesus' rule. Now, when you recognize about the areas here where you're falling down on, remember that the only person who has lived these things out fully is Jesus Christ. He's the only person who's done it. No other human can do it. And that's why when we turn to Jesus, we turn from our sin and turn to Jesus and put our trust in him, what happens is that all of this is credited to our account. So yeah, it's true that none of you, none of us in this room have loved others as much as we love ourselves. But Jesus did fulfill that law and so that is credited to our account. It's true that none of us love God wholeheartedly, but Jesus did, and that is credited to our account. And that's why we need to trust in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and trust in his righteousness put on us like a pure robe so that we have Christ's righteousness and not our own. Let's pray. Jesus, looking at these verses, we are so aware of where we fall short and of our sinfulness. And we are sorry of that, Lord. We repent. We ask that you would change us so that we can live these out to be pleasing to you. And we recognize that in this life we will never live them out fully. But we know that you did, Jesus. And so we thank you for your righteous life and for your righteousness that's credited to our account. Thank you for clothing us in your righteousness. Protect us, God, from coming away from this and just trying by works to live a right life. But help us to always have it in the forefront of our mind that it's your righteousness that makes us right with God the Father. I pray that you would renew our minds today. Help us to love God more and to love our neighbours and protect us from ever living as enemies to you, Jesus. Amen.